This is a Wild Game Production Podcast. You remember. Roll your stealth roll. Game books, pencils, pizza, cheese puffs, and a hell of a lot of dice. And the dragon woke up. Roll for initiative. This is the Roll for Initiative podcast, where 1E is the place to be. Welcome everyone to the Roll for Initiative podcast. This is volume 10, issue 220. DM Matt here. We got no... You're not then. No Vince, no Vince. Um, You're right. not Vince. Where's Vince? Well, I think he might. There's a potential he oh, might Vince, be. Where is he? I'm scared. He might be going to the land of Oz. It's entirely oh. possible. We're waiting for some feedback. Um, yeah, we got some inclement weather down in his neck of the woods. Might be in oh. a storm. Yeah, he I'm may be. Scared. He may be going over the rainbow. We we will keep a full update on any of his uh, adventures in the land of Oz. Oh, I'm kidding. Anyway. Yeah. <laughs> hey, maybe he'll get us some really good stats on those flying monkeys. Mm, indeed. So. Well, like that's like that's it. That's Matt and me, Nick. Yes. Um, we are going to do uh, for our topic here in a little bit. We're going to cover non-weapon proficiencies. Yes. The the thing that appeared in the la- later uh, years of first edition that kind of almost set the stage, the transition to 2E. Second. Yeah, everybody yeah. kind of refers to it now as 1.5, I suppose. Yeah, you can That's start. Kind of it, you know. Yeah, you can start seeing the groundwork laid. Yeah. Uh, but, yeah, but it's been a while since we've done a show. Uh, so yeah, yeah, life has a way of doing that. Yes, it does. <laughs> but there hasn't been, I know, am I in a lack of gaming? So what about you, Nick? What have you been up to in gaming? Um. Well, since the I talked about our last Star Wars game, nothing really. Uh, it'll be not this coming weekend, but next weekend we'll be doing uh, uh, the Continuation of the New York chapter for Masks of Narlothotep. Oh. So, yeah, that'll be coming up uh, the weekend, I think, the 27th. Okay. So that'll that'll be very exciting. I'm looking forward to that. But other than that, you know, just life. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. yeah. I had my uh, little uh, annual weekend board gaming getaway at the... Towards huh. The, yes. We got... Rented a cabin, had seven of us in there, and we just board gamed all weekend. Basically, it's all the games we buy year round that we never actually get on the table. That's our excuse to get it on the table. So, cool. this is our eighth year of doing it, too. So. Wow. He, almost as long as the podcast. Yeah. Yeah. We started actually doing that in like 2012 when I totally stole the idea when I heard Sam Witwer talk about him and his friends renting a house to like do RPG gaming for a week since they can only game like once a year if they booked it out in advance and planned it. I'm like, you know, wow. I'm like, that would be a fun thing to do. So, and I pitched it to my friends and we're like, yeah, hell yeah, let's do this. Talk about binge gaming. That's like crazy. Yeah. They basically do like 40 hours of gaming over the course of a week from what, from what I remember, because that's the only time they get the game and get to all be together because of their schedule. So they basically cram in a campaign over the course of a week. That's crazy. But it's got to be so intense and so much fun. Oh, yeah. And then it takes a year to recover from it. So by the time you're recovered, it's you're ready to go again. That's that's kind of cool. That yeah. is kind of cool. Yeah. So. Yeah. And then after that, we tried out, uh, my group did uh, the newest edition of Hackmaster. So. Yeah. How'd that turn out? Um, It was interesting. Um, <laughs> We had some uh issues with the account system i mean it's very as soon as i saw how the mechanics were playing i'm like oh this is kind of like aces and eights without the playing cards there you go so but when you go in with that fantasy mindset shoehorning in that count system it was just it just made combats we felt a little sluggish and aces and eights just like that once you get into combat, it slows everything down. <laughs> right. It works 
great if you're doing like a duel with a one-on-one and you're pulling out your gun in the high noon at the OK Corral doing your quick little shootout. But if you're trying but, to do a more D&D style combat, you could spend an entire session in combat. Yeah. So, yeah. So yeah, I was, I was kind of, it's okay system, but it's not to my taste. So there you go. What can I say? Right. So. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's definitely worth looking at to just see if it's for you because it is a very different take on fantasy. But yeah, if you've played yep. Aces and H, you've got an idea what you're getting into. So if that's your thing, go for it. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. And then other than that, uh, we're just trying to sort out what our next campaign will be. Haven't quite hammered it down yet. We got a whole bunch of mm-hmm. ideas thrown out, so we'll see where that goes. And, well, cool. Yep. And this is and now let's just go right into our topic th- today, those non-weapon proficiencies. Those pesky non-weapon uh, proficiencies. Right. Because <laughs> I, I, to a lot of like the old school players, it's kind of like, do we really need them? Because, I mean, right. when, you, when you go to the core books, you had secondary skills. That's the closest thing you got to a non-weapon proficiency. You had that. Right, that- that being in the DMG, if I remember correctly. Right, that little chart in the DMG, and is basically told, let your players roll on this so they know what they did before they became an adventurer. Mm-hmm. And I've used that. It, it's a nice little way to flesh out the characters and give them a general idea of, you know, a little bit more than the average person on this topic. And right. It, you, but, you had a profession before you went out and became an adventurer. and I mean... And I think there was just a little blurb on below it, a little paragraph on how to, as a DM, how to adjudicate on all that. I mean, right. It was very light and loose and just kind of there. It almost doesn't fit in with much of anything else. Well, I'm trying to, I'm trying to figure out, like, if you look at, like, what if you're playing a magic user and you roll that you were once a, a, um, a hunter or a fisher? Mm Mm-hmm. Does that make sense for a background for a magic user? Yeah, it c- I think it could. Okay, you're the you were like a your father was a fisherman. You were like getting sucked into the family business, but it just wasn't for you. So you snuck off to school and read your books when your parents hated you for it because you did your reading and writing instead of your fishing. But, oh, okay. So I always spend those into part of your backstory as to. Make sh- make sure to incorporate it as to why you are what you are now, like mm, like okay. when I, I guess that could work that way. Like when I ran my Ravenloft game, we had a bunch. We like some of the dwarves actually rolled; they were like miners. So it was like they grew tired of being covered in soot, and slaving away in the mines, and wanted something mm. better. Went out to the big city and looking for fame and fortune. Boom! Backstory fits it in. There you go. Huh. Yeah, and I guess I could see no matter who you are, you could probably figure out something that fits with any particular character class there as far as a secondary skill. You can really just going to have to elaborate it on a little more. Right. I mean, Uh, and that's the advantage of where they're so general. There's all kinds of ways you can incorporate it. It's like in the mm -hmm. instance of, say, you had a magic user, but he was a miner. Maybe he wasn't actually in the mines with the pickaxe, but he was the one that helped actually lay out the structure of the mines, like the supports right, like, and everything. Like he was an engineer of some sort. Yeah. So, I mean, there's mm-hmm. ways to incorporate that. And I think that's part of if you use non-weapon proficiencies, use them to flesh out your character and give your character more personality as opposed to just min-max them. Right, right. It's like your your character should have these skills for a reason, not just because they're going to help you game better. So I guess we could say maybe that the secondary skills was like the 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 impetus of a the beginnings of maybe what we could see later on, which become um, non weapon proficiencies in the game. Yeah, because and as you go on. To other editions, they had both. They had the non-weapon proficiencies right. and secondary and weapon, Yeah, and, and weapon, weapon proficiencies and non-weapon. Yeah. And I, and as far as I know, like as far as tracking all the history of like how they were eventually were 
introduced in the first edition, it was actually might be some surprise to some people is was it was Oriental Adventures that you finally that you officially got to see. As far as I could tell, non weapon proficiencies were incorporated into the actual rules. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Granted, it was Oriental Adventures, which came out in '85. And this was, again, this was still kind of on the twilight. This was on the twilight years of first edition. Right. Because it wasn't really until I would say like maybe a year later that they really started. You could kind of tell there's a new edition coming. But I mean, you had the, you had a, in this case though, they had a chart for each character class in Oriental Adventures of what proficiencies they could get for like, um, you know, artisan, barbarian proficiencies, court, and common proficiencies. And I guess for all the character classes, they could pick them and how many slots it care, it uh, requires and what the the base chance score is. Right. And you could and you could go into all the rules and how they work. And um, I don't think they were they weren't very strict. I guess rules wise. I mean, I think as a DM, you can be kind of loosey goosey with them. Yeah. I mean, I. Yeah. I don't remember. I'm trying to think of when I, when this book came out, and we were like, you know, everybody was all excited because it has Gary Gygax's name on it. But then we find out later on as we grew up that you know he really wasn't very involved with it. Right. <laughs> it was more about to get money for 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 a TSR at the time, but that's a whole other story. Yeah, and then. But, with the Oriental Adventures too, I think having those proficiencies help makes sense. Yeah, yeah, they make sense. Yeah, they make sense because think also from a Western world view, we're not going to know what the skill set would be of an average person in that type of setting. It's hmm. I would say just due to cultural knowledge, having those in there help you have an idea of how that culture is set up. Right, because right. a lot of you're getting things in like calligraphy, and then the oh, I'm drawing a blank on the exact skill, but the one where it comes to oh, uh, like, the bo- well, the bonds like- that was sculpting the bonsai and uh, all of there's a lot of skills that you would not see in your typical medieval ish Western fantasy. So right. I think some of that is even just this is how the what's going on in the world and having that kind of this is what the commoners do when it comes to your calligraphy with your right. artisanship. You got, you and got all the that. court proficiency. You got court proficiency such as calligraphy, uh, etiquette, falconry, right. heraldry. Now, some of those they could apply in a Western setting, but but what about no? It's a type of drama performed in the lands of Kaatur. It's it's a type of. I guess they're talking. I don't know. Is it kabuki? Yeah, it, yeah, it would be that type of performance. So with all of this, you if you read through there, it actually helps flesh out the setting. Sure. Because that rem- um, you have to remember, this is like a player book, a DM book, and a s- campaign setting all in one and not many pages. Right. So you have to mine for what the world is like in every section. All right, so some of these, you know, they could – they would pour it over to later on into two other books, but some of these are like, you know, they yeah, they're setting specific, like, uh, you know, like no and tea ceremony, for right. example, or, um, what's another one that seems, well, even, even most of these could be ported over. I mean, even like, uh, paper maker that could be ported over. Right. But that was like in, in, um, being in Oriental Adventures, I'm trying to think if, you know, if we ever really used them or not. I don't think it was... I, I, I'm trying to think if we... If they felt kind of like they were optional. Yeah. I mean, like, pretty much the non-weapon proficiencies that appeared in later books, too. It's like, they're, right. they're there if you want them, but did anyone really use them? Right. I don't see. I don't remember ever using them when. I mean, even because now we're talking about when you get into the later books, you had, um, uh, you know the 
the Wilderness Survival Guide and the Dungeoneer Survival Guide. And that's where you really started to see the uh, the non-weapon proficiencies, you know, come into their own into AD&D. And again, it just seemed like one of those things where they didn't necessarily uh, make it feel like that it was a requirement. They was, And these were all like supplemental books anyway. Right. I mean, really, you could say that none of it was really required for all of those books. Right. I mean, you could go to our old episodes on both of those books and be like, there's some interesting space they are exploring, but is it really adding anything? Any depth? Right, without adding exponential bookkeeping. Right. And I guess some of the... I guess some of the, uh, I don't want to say controversy, but the, I guess the the argument is, you know, for pro, for the non-win proficiency is say, hey, now we have a game mechanic that we can use to where it comes up to this situation. We, we can somehow, we can make a roll to see if you're successful or not. Okay. I can see the I can see the benefits of that. It takes some of the ambiguity away. Right, but you have to think about it. If you have the would every commoner that's ever ridden on a horse have the horse riding proficiency? No. I see having that proficiency meaning you're better at it than the average run of the mill person. Not that mm. the average person without that skill can do it. It's basically the difference between unskilled but uh, say you do your own handiwork, being an unskilled plumber where you just you tinkered around, you figured out how to do stuff compared to someone who actually studied plumbing. Right. I mean, that's like, you know, like I'm looking here at the wilderness proficiencies, like running, like everybody can run. But if you have the running non-weapon proficiency, that means that you can keep it up for just, you know, a little bit longer, you have much more in your endurance involved. You know, that's where the like that proficient comes into play. Like you said, it's like everybody can run. There's just some people can run better than others. Hence the non-weapon proficiency. Right. It It's a way to show exceptionalism. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Well, like I said, there was the pro part of it. Like, Hey, we have a consistent rule now for some of these things that come up in game and, we have a way of like, you know, people can earn these things, but also on the, on the con end, I suppose would be, well, it's just getting more, you're introducing more rules into the game system and it takes away some of the flow of the game and it takes away some of the, uh, what's the term I'm, lo- I'm looking for the uncertainty. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Maybe. Be- yeah, uh, of certain situations yeah, because you can kind of min max a little more. Um, the other thing I would say that with web non weapon proficiencies is you can fall in that trap of if I'm if someone's not proficient in it they can't do it. I don't like that. I'd, right. I mean, like like I mean, you could do what you know, like they do. I was I always refer to Call of Cthulhu and some of this stuff where I can find you know examples. I just think it's a really good system. It's like their basic role playing system is. Uh, uh, you can make an unskilled attempt. You know, everybody can do that. Right. That's how I would do it, right? Just, you're just, your chances are infinitesimal if you're making an unskilled roll. But you can go ahead and try, right? Right, exactly. But it's like in later editions, I think this is, in, this is kind of setting the stage for when you got into later editions where if you didn't have your skill points assigned to that, you just really couldn't do it. Or you weren't right. good at all at it, and to the point where it was worthless to even try for well, very basic got, things. Right, and then, and it got to the point where you're reducing a good chunk of the experience to dice rolling. Right, the the randomness when it became more about solving a math problem and min maxing your chance, and it became more about winning. And I think it's just a as the players changing what people were looking for out of their gaming evolved. It became more about how do I, 
ha- give myself more control over my character so I always get the outcome I want. Yeah, and and I think the non-weapon proficiency is kind of, you know, they go down that road a little bit. Right. You know, I, and, and I think as a DM, you have to be careful on if you're going to introduce these into your game that – you don't want to have everything reduced to a die roll, I think, or, you know, to right. the roll of the dice. I mean, you know, there has to be some sort of, I mean, it is an RPG. It is a role-playing game. Mm-hmm. So you would hope that there's going to still be some role-playing involved. Right. and in, in some for, way or another. Yeah, for some of the skill checks where you could be like, oh, I'll just have my character roll a die to see if I succeed or fail. I would also let them bypass that die roll if they come up with something really creative, even if they're untrained. I'm or not, give them a bonus. Or give them a like bonus that. or something like that. How, however, I, the, Yeah, however the DM wants to do it. Right. I wouldn't make the die roll of the proficiency check the live and die. Right. It, it should just be – non-weapon proficiencies should be a tool to enhance the game. It shouldn't be a tool to avoid adversity – on the player's end. It shouldn't be a crutch on the DMs for adjudicating things or rolling thing or coming up with scenarios. Just like, oh, you got the skill, whatever. No. Maybe it, maybe it, instead of like success failure, maybe it, unless it's a critical failure, let's put it that way. Right. Maybe it determines some certain degree of success. Yeah. You know, I, I think, you know, like, uh, a D, the Star Wars, the original West End Games version, the D6 version, when you had to make a skill roll, you know, if you fall fell within a certain range, you was a, you had a certain varying degrees of success. Doesn't mean you always failed. It says even if you had a low roll, it not necessarily means oh you just did you just did figure it out or whatever. It's like oh well, you, um, you know that there. In this star system, you just don't know exactly where, right? Or or per- something, something like that. Yeah. Or perhaps it's ta- you get it done, but it's not as smooth. It takes a little longer, a little more difficult than you expected. If you had a poor die roll, but it's not like it needs to derail everything either. Mm-hmm. It's just it's just the way to help flesh out the experience of completing that task, that die roll. Hmm. Yeah, I I agree. There's some varying degrees of success. Now, that's one way of doing it. Now, other DMs might want to say, okay, no, I'm just going to use it as a whole success failure sort of right. sort of thing. And that's fine because if you're as a DM, if you want to keep the, the the action going in that respect, I can understand yeah. going that way. It's like, okay, you know, okay, you need to you need to uh, you know, cross this underground river and each of you need to make a uh, swimming roll. And those of you, uh, yeah, let me know what you and whoever fails, um, they was like, okay, you're, you're beginning to, you're, you're drowning. Right. <laughs> so make constitution checks. I mean, as a DM, you could do that. Right. I mean, just throw an example there. Yeah. If, um, but with something like swimming, I wouldn't as a DM, if a character wasn't proficient in swimming, say they don't know how to swim. Right. Unless they actually built that in as part of their character, then they said in part of the character's on, yeah, my character is afraid of water, doesn't know how to swim because whatever. Okay, that's different. But just because you're not proficient in swimming doesn't mean you can't tread water. So I'm not going to be like, oh, you're going to drown if you just step in that water because you don't know how to mm-hmm. swim without that proficiency. I right. wouldn't. Don't, don't fall down that trap because then it, right. the game becomes too dependent upon the. Uh, uh, your non-weapon proficiencies. That'd be like, does anyone really need a non-weapon proficiency open doorknob? No. Right. No. Nope. Then it gets just so detailed. It's like, no, that makes no sense. Right. There, There is a game system that's almost like that. I'm trying to remember what it is. I know Palladium has about 5,000 different skills for every. Is it Palladium? They do. Um, they have like different skills for everything. Yeah, you actually get like skill checks to read and write your native tongue. Yeah, uh, I mean, and it's like at ninety eight percent proficiency. Uh, but and but yeah, they have a lot of a lot of skills. It 
It makes character creation interesting. You could really craft interesting characters, but it's also sure. time consuming as well. Right. Yeah, I have a copy of Palladiums here somewhere. Oh, there it is. Yeah. <laughs> I think I bought a copy just to say I had one. <laughs> yeah. I, I got a lot of my Palladium stuff when they every year they do their big Christmas sale where uh, where you can get like a hundred bucks worth of stuff for fifty bucks and every, all the writers will autograph all the books. Mm-hmm. So it's like Oh wow. Yeah. So I I'll do that and I'll get like six, seven books for like sixty dollars shipped all autographed. Right. And I think you were now that I'm thinking about it, now you're it's it's funny that you mentioned palladium because palladium I think this kind of fits in the conversation because we're talking about skills. Palladium has that in the system where it's basically Palladium RPG is really a, a heavily house ruled version of AD and D when it came out or D and D. Right, right, and it, yeah, because yeah, it came out in the early eighties prior to uh, it was like eighty one, eighty three, somewhere in that ballpark. Yeah. And I mean, yeah, it, it was heavily house ruled, but it also added a lot of skill checks. Were very yeah, the important. original, the first edition of of Palladium RPG came out in eighty three, and I got the one that came out in nineteen ninety eight. Pr- the eighth printing of the was it the revised edition rules? Yeah, and, and most of the revisions, there's not nothing super drastic. It's more they clean up some of the rules, they tweak this a little thing here or there, adjust things. Right. Uh, but, uh, change but like, what's mental illness. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, a palladium system is a, is a system where it's kind of a hybrid system between having a class level system, but you also have skills available for that system as well. Um, it's kind of like if AD and D and Call of Cthulhu had a love child in a way, right? There's another system that was like that was like that too. I'm trying to remember what the hell it was called, because um, I remember playing it in the early '80s as well. It was, it was, um, it what Atlantean system? Okay, you know there was there was a system. It was like. Um, it was a lot like Palladium, but it was still like a class level system. One of the races were called Andaman, Andaman. Okay. Yeah. I don't think I've heard of that. Yeah. It was called Atlantean system or something like that. I remember playing it. And again, it was, this was like early mid eighties. Atlantis. I think. Yeah, it was the Atlantis. I think it's Atlantis had like a black book with a pentagram on it. Yes, yes, yeah, yes. It was the, it, yeah. It. it was originally yeah, Arcanium. Uh, the Arcanium. Thank you. Yeah, published by Bard Games. Yes, yes, that's it. That was an intriguing system, not just because of the of the campaign setting where it was like Earth, but you still had you know Atlantis, Lemuria, and Moo, and all that stuff before. It, you know, for the seas drink Atlantis, ha ha ha. Right, um, yeah, that yeah, because Atlantis was the second age of that, like according to the Wikipedia's. Uh, right, uh, yeah, because it was like right. a, it's like pseudo real world history with all the fantasy tropes. Hmm. But it was a uh, that was another kind of like I I call it a hybrid system. You still had like class level, but you also had skills available for every class that you could get, you know, proficient in. That you can earn and you, and and that you are knowledgeable on, um, so and, and like you said, Call of Cthulhu was like that, which to a great to a certain ex- also extent went, went to RuneQuest. So, but which is funny because RuneQuest, Palladium, were all derivatives of D anD D. Right. They were all they were all just and and if you know the history of the game. Those two systems are derivatives of the original D and D system, just heavily house ruled. Right, and that's where you have all your proficiencies come in, and or your, or your skills that come in. Yeah, and you can see a lot of the customization is then the house rules all kind of focus on giving the players more options to customize their character. Yeah, that's it's 
that seems to be the big area where these games veered off in different directions. It, it was more about how can we give the players more options than just race class. Right, right. It, where you like it, like you were saying, gaming was evolving into that uh, into a system where you had they wanted to give more options to players when they made their characters. The, the the to I guess the I guess the skills when skills are introduced it kind of helps flesh out the character more on who they are. Um, but it just seems like in some people seemed it like it was a crutch because you know you should you as a player should define your character not have the skills define what the character is. Right. You know. Yeah. It's like for my like real world for myself I'm a I'm a training coordinator. I teach people how to do soldering and electronics and the basics on on doing um, uh, electronics installation. But that's not just my job is not just who I am. I'm a lot of other things too. Right. So. Yeah, it's like for me, I sometimes I will like if there's random charts to roll up a character when it comes to their skills and it, things of that nature, I'll do it just more as a creative exercise. I have mm-hmm. these this jumble of just numbers and skills. How do I make this a living, breathing, cohesive character? And then yeah. so I use that as like a creative uh, writing exercise. It's like mm-hmm. like if I play Marvel. In Marvel, I'm going to randomly roll my character, background, powers, just randomly roll everything and try to make sense of it. And I, mm-hmm. for, for me, that's part of fun of that game. When yeah. I come to D&D, though, usually I have more of a character concept in mind stepping in before I even touch the books or dice. I hmm. have an idea of I kind of want to play this character. How do sure. I get there? Right. And then it might, be, and then as I roll my attributes, it'll vary a little bit. I'll be like, okay, well, this doesn't quite make sense because the ads don't attributes don't quite line up. But I have an idea of where I'm going prior. Whereas other systems, I'll be like, well, eh, I'll roll, I'll make something, then figure it out on the back end. You know, it's it's funny, and now I'm thinking back on my gaming experience when you're talking about. I, I guess this goes into the other thing. When you're talking about like non-weapon proficiencies here, I think this ties in like complexities of a game system and certain biases players have towards certain systems. I remember seeing that when I was growing up in my in my my younger years as a player, where it's like Oh, you play that? Well, yeah, you should play this. This is far more complex. This is far more, you know, uh, you know, there was a, a certain amount of of arrogance some people had towards certain systems, like, you know, like people playing, um, you know, maybe Palladium because because they have these all these rules for skills and all these different professions and stuff like that. They felt like that their system because it had more, it was better. Right. It, you know? It was that era's version of the Edition Wars. Yeah. Yeah. And I think maybe, I, I could be completely wrong, but maybe having the proficiencies at the time that they came out, you know, the non-weapon proficiencies that came out in Oriental Adventures and the two survival guide books, you know, I think that was a way of TSR and making AD and D is like, you know what, we could be as complex as we want to. Right. You know, that might have been uh, that might have been part of it. I'm pu- this is purely speculation on my own on my own behalf. But I could I think it's not out of the realm of possibility that you know people demanding a little bit more of a complex game that's why the non weapon proficiencies were were introduced over that time. Right. So they could, it was like a whole kind of like me, part of the, you know, competing with other game systems out there. Yeah. Cause you if know? you look at, think of some of the contemporary games for, in that 85, 86, what were you getting? When you look at it, you're getting a lot of things that have skills. 
Yeah. Uh, and also at this point, they they probably even in 1985. Hey, we're going to need a new edition soon. So I yeah. So at that point, there's what, the rumblings of that already in 85 or 86 for sure. Oh yeah, by yeah by the time Unearth Arcana came out in 86, it was like okay, we got a new edition coming. Uh but when you look at it, what design space did they still have? for ad and d by that time that they hadn't already touched that's a good question they're what they i mean they covered most everything else uh, so that's true. why we got these the orange spine books with what there's in it those are areas yeah. they hadn't developed out in the game yet and i think that's where second edition came along because they're like you know we have how many books out here for first edition you know you have the three core books plus two additional monster books. You have the survival guides. You had, you had seven books, roughly. Right. Maybe eight. Yeah. If you're counting some of the other stuff. Yeah, if and you're like, like we, need the consol- and we need to consolidate all of this. And that's where second edition came in. Mm-hmm. Right. And then also, we need to change it enough that it warrants, if you already have the books, you need to buy the new ones. Right. So, because otherwise you could just be like, eh, I can skip this. It's like when, when Palladium revises a book with the way they do it, there's not that need to go and you have to get the revised version. Your old one's perfectly fine. And other than a few things, you could, you, the game's not very different. Whereas your first edition and second edition that you can see the foundations are similar, but are actually very different when it comes to the details. Mm Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. But even between first and second edition, it was so easy to port over characters. It was it was ridiculously easy. Right, because it was more of an evolution than a a giant jump. Like between second and third. Right. Where you had a whole separate, what, 22, 24-page booklet to convert your characters. And that's a whole other thing I don't even want to talk about. Right. So, but hey, it, but it, I think it, I think you bright like when you bring up at the time, eighty four, eighty five, eighty six, you know, when you're getting to the mid mid and late eighties, the evolution of game design was yeah, a lot of skills are being introduced, and I think TSR as a response trying to make their flagship game relevant, they introduced those sorts of things as non weapon proficiencies. Right. Yeah. Because, yeah, they a lot of the games at the time are going to have a lot more charts than even AD&D mm-hmm. did. Um, yeah. And, a lot, and just a lot more granularity when it comes to character creation and character detail. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of games that come to mind uh, that, like, Middle-Earth role-playing was really, you know, w- was becoming very popular. Yeah. Um, and then two, you had, what was it, Role Master, which was really complex. Right. You had Role Master. You had, and and then you even get into like some of the other genres when you have like what, what Traveler was doing. Oh my God. Yeah. Traveler. Yeah. That, and I think there was, a, there was a new edition of Traveler that came out that time. If I were trying to remember correctly, it wasn't very popular. But, um, yeah, you had Traveler. You had, to think of Top Secret, another TSR property, Top Secret. Top Secret, yeah. Um, Marvel superheroes. You had DC heroes, right? Um, which was you know, if Ghostbusters. There yeah. was another one. Yeah, Ghost, you know? well, Ghostbusters was the foundation for other games. Yeah, and then- uh, Star Wars came out in '87. The Star Wars RPG came out in '87. I mean, a lot of them. You saw the evolution from going from a class level system. For characters to more, um, uh, how should I say, a more organic, a more uh, um, open, yeah, way of cre- character creation, right? You know, but, yeah, there wasn't that defined. Okay, work down the list. You are this, which means you can be this, this, or this, and it kind of is a flowchart. Whereas mm-hmm. with the organic systems where you don't have a class like if, like in a top secret, you don't have a class. Right. You just have, you have your a bunch skills. Of skills. Yeah. And that defines who you are. And then in like Traveler, you're, I mean, you roll your jobs, you roll for everything. 
And yeah. through the course of that, you get your skills and all of this and get a very different character every time you play. I still get a kick out of Traveler. It's the only game system I ever knew where during character creation, your character could die. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, one time I was, we, me and some friends were starting a Traveler game. I died three times during character yeah. creation. Just during character creation. Yeah. You want, you want to talk about cutthroat. <laughs> right. Everyone should experience that once. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But, so. you, but yeah, but yeah, it's like the non-weapon proficiencies is just, I think, as much a reflection of the times and what was going on in gaming than anything else. And then, mm. but, and then it just comes down to, is that your flavor of gaming? I mean, that, and that's really, because you don't need them. They're not. They're, it's an absolute filler rule. Now, have you ever used the non-weapon proficiencies at all? Not not in, not in the first edition game. Nope. No, I don't think. Now, as a as a DM, no. But as a player, I might have, depending on who the DM was. Yeah. I know. Uh, with playing Oriental Adventures, I believe I have, if I remember correctly. But later on, with, um, with uh, the wilderness and the Dungeoneer survival guides. They were probably the least used books of my collection. I have them because I have them. Right. You, <laughs> you need know? them in the collection, but you don't actually need to bring them off the shelf. Right. Um, so, you know, there's that, but I don't, I don't, I had never used them when I did first edition AD and D at all. I never found a use for the non-weapon proficiencies. Yeah, I didn't either. Um, because yeah, it was just like, it's just bogging my game down. It's not, it, it, all it's doing is introducing more books that need to be at my table that mm -hmm. aren't, aren't necessary. And my players aren't, and, and like my gaming group, they're not hardcore first deep players. So whatever I bring to the table is what they're going to play. If I wanted right. to run full options, we're using the temperature tables from the Wilderness Survival Guide and all the crazy <laughs> stuff, they'll go with it. Yeah. But that's going to make the game so clunky and it's not going to be as enjoyable as it was. Right. But, all you're doing is just sitting there and rolling dice and not interacting with each other. Right. It's, it's it, At that point, we we're kind of playing a quasi-cooperative solitaire game. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So... I'm I'm not sure what else I could say on the on the subject myself. I think, yeah, I, I think th we pretty much covered it. Yeah, I think we did too. Because I mean, really, it's something that's there. It's interesting. You and when you, especially when you look at it in the time frame that they were introduced, but it's just something in the game you can throw in. But mm -hmm. I think most people don't. And yeah, I think it's interesting. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Continue. Yeah. Yeah, and I was just going to say, if anyone out there uses them in our game, uh, write in and let us know um, just how you got use these non-weapon proficiencies. Do you use them? Is there anyone out there that actually use them? Rule is written because I'm still looking for that person. Yeah, me too. I and I think putting it in the context of the time when those books came out, um, how you can see. Uh, TSR AD and D was trying to compete with other systems that had something similar, so they felt, you know, hey, this is this is maybe some historical background on why why they did what they did, besides trying to make more money, right? Which I think was goal one: make yeah. more money. But we need a book out so people will buy it, so we can pay off our debt that we have out there in California at our TSR hobbies in Hollywood. <laughs> right, yeah, because that cartoon money wasn't paying all the bills. No, no, it was not. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, write in, let us know, rfistaff at gmail.com. And then we also have our hotline. And the hotline? Yes, the hotline. Who's staffing it now? Because it's been a while since we've had some. Um, we've got uh, some. Um, what were they? Oh, we hired. We don't have kobolds anymore. No, no. We 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 had some budget cuts, and we. Like, yeah, it's been we so have, long. It's Vince is the one in charge of the call center people. And now they're undead. Oh, <laughs> oh, skeleton kobolds. Okay, got it. So yes, yeah, skeleton and zombie kobolds. Yeah, they're they're makes they're, it easier. 
Yeah, they they don't actually say anything when you answer. They just transcribe what you say. Just, it's perfect. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's great. Far cheaper. We saves saves us on all the break room concessions. And we don't. Yeah, we don't have to feed them. <laughs> you could also you could also go to iTunes and look us up there. You could give us start reviews. Yeah, and you can go to our 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 website. Yeah, our and website, rfipodcast.com. Or, or you can go to Facebook and reach us there. You can also, I think we have Twitter. We, Twitter well, too? we have a Twitter that's mostly just us broadcasting out news shows. We're not actually active on it. Um, okay. We have our individual I Twitters. Tw- Twitters. I have mine. I don't tweet. Yes, you're one of those people. You, you're Tweeting cool for the you. birds. <laughs> I've got a tweeter. Uh, mostly, I mostly hey, it's hey, wrestling hey, related hey, stuff. Hey, hey I, I don't care. What, you know, let's keep it clean. Yeah, what? yeah. <laughs> you can find me at uh, D E G E N X on Twitter or Vince at the Evil DM. So yeah, that's how you can get a hold of us. And write us up. Let us yeah. know what you think about these weapon proficiencies, or if you have show ideas or anything else, or if you just feel like writing long tomes uh just if just you ha- say hey hey yeah just say hi send us your manifestos we're all good whatever you got sure 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 so i guess with that note uh we'll sign off and just keep it original and keep it old school and good night to everybody good night everyone for initiative.